Professor Piers Keen works at the forefront of the use of machine learning in ophthalmology. He is a consultant ophthalmologist at the Moorfields Eye Hospital in London, the world's oldest eye hospital. He also is a professor of medical artificial intelligence at University College London. His research team consistently publishes their work in top impact journals and has previously collaborated with DeepMind on the analysis of retinal scans. We discussed his career path, the nuances and challenges of applying machine learning in medicine and where he sees this field going in the future. Thanks again, Professor Keane, for agreeing to come onto the show today. So the first question is, can you describe your career path to where you are now? Well, I, yeah, I'm, I love I love talking about my myself and uh, what we've what I've done, or, you know, what I've done so far. And uh, hopefully people will find that interesting. Um, so my I guess my background is that I'm originally from from Ireland. Uh, sort of born and brought up in Dublin, went to medical school in Ireland in University College Dublin. Uh, and so I graduated uh, uh, from UCD in 2002. And uh, I guess one of the things for me during medical school was that uh, I knew that I was interested in ophthalmology from a very early age. I knew that I was interested in clinical academics and in research from an early age. And so um, w- one of the things that I did that was, I think, pretty cool uh, as a medical student was that I became very interested in bionic eyes, in intraocular retinal prostheses. And so actually, I was very fortunate that I was able to spend a summer in the Wilmer Eye Institute in Johns Hopkins, working with some of the engineers who were developing the bionic eye. And so that was a, that was a kind of... Uh, little taster of this kind of like very kind of grand world of and you know people trying to build amazing things to do to really cause impact on a global scale so anyway i i finished um finished med school 2002 i uh, knew i wanted to get into ophthalmology i uh, did my internship in ireland so i guess that's the kind of equivalent of a foundation year but just one year that we do in ireland and um after I finished that, I took a year out to do a master's in physiology. And so that was the kind of standard route into ophthalmology training in Ireland at the time. And so during that time, you would, I guess, do some of the standard things you might do in trying to get into training schemes in the UK uh, in the present day, in that you would do the first part of your membership or your fellowship exams. And you would sort of try and do some research to kind of bump up your CV. And essentially, I got onto one of the ophthalmology training schemes in the, in the south of Ireland, spent three years doing basic surgical training in ophthalmology, and then became interested in, you know, really wanted to continue the academic path. And so decided to go to the to US to take a couple of years out to do research. And so I went to Los Angeles, to the Doheny Eye Institute in Los Angeles, and spent two years there uh, doing research. Now, then what happened was I was think when I was going to the US, I was thinking about essentially trying to get into residency in the US. I'd done my US MLEs and all of that stuff. Um, but it, it's very, very challenging in ophthalmology as a foreign graduate to get into the scheme. And what happened was I happened to meet uh, this Irish guy called Tom Flynn at a conference in Florida. And he told me that he was doing his PhD in in UCL and he was working in more fields and um, told me that there was this new thing called the NIHR in, in the UK. And he said that they have these uh, this academic clinical lecturer post. And essentially that would allow you to spend 50% of your time doing research and 50% of your time doing clinical. And it would allow you to finish the rest of your training. And more fields is going to be advertising one of those posts. And so it was like that one random meeting was a seminal moment in my life because I more or less decided there and then that I was going to pivot from the US and I was going to try and come to London, try and get this ACL post and so on. So what happened then was fast forward a year, 18 months later, and a few bumps along the way, but somehow I managed to get this NIHR academic clinical lecturer post um, in more fields and in UCL. That allowed me to spend the next four years finishing my surgical training in ophthalmology 
uh, with 50% of time protected for research. And then coming to the end of that time period, as you're coming towards um, CCT, uh, you're starting to think about, okay, how do I become a consultant? How do I set up my own clinical research group? And so I was very fortunate to apply for the next stage in the academic pathway, which is an NIHR Clinician Scientist Award. That's recently that's been changed. The name has been changed to an NIHR Advanced Fellowship. And so I got this NIHR Clinician Scientist Award that funded me for five years and it funded me as a consultant. So when you can get one of those big personal fellowship grants, whether it be from NIHR or Wellcome or MRC, that funds your that that funds you as a consultant, but also funds your research. And so then I was able to start as a consultant in more fields, but and uh, as a, a researcher at UCL. But the nice thing was that seventy percent of my time was protected for research, and then that was the time when I started to develop my own research group and started to become interested in new technologies and innovation in ophthalmology and in particular AI. And I've heard you mention previously on in, in an interview that uh, you're very focused on this from code to clinic yeah. uh, process. Yeah. And I've also met, heard you mention previously in an interview that um, quite often people think that coming up with the model that uh, that can yeah. classify uh Rest, uh, OCP scans is uh, is the hard part. Well, actually, the hard part is the implementation. So my question yeah. is, um, what are the main challenges to scaling that implementation that you've seen so far? It's a great question. And before I answer it, let me just say that um, what I've just expanded on the point that you highlighted in the question, which is uh, what I've learned is that really there's this massive spectrum of translation, which is like, the first half of it is going from an idea to an algorithm, and publishing a paper in a cool journal. And the second half of it is then going from code to clinic. And that's actually seeing it deployed at scale. And each of those steps has many, many different sort of sub steps along the way. And so in particular, in the first half, it's really all about how you can aggregate and curate the data that you will use for your machine learning algorithms, for the training of your machine learning algorithms. And it turns out that that's, even though there's an abundance of data there, getting the ethical approvals, getting the information governance sign-offs, labeling the data, that's all really challenging and painful to do. And it's only people, I think, it's not only people like us, but I think clinical academics who are in the system are the people who are in the best position, to, I think, I'm biased, of course, to, to sort of oversee and drive that process. And then once we have the data the way we want it, we can work very closely with computer scientists and engineers. And that could be in a university setting or that could be in, in industry to actually train the models. But then we go to what you actually asked me about, which is actually the implementation. And so I think that there's kind of what most people would say is, OK, you it's one thing to train a model and do a proof of concept on a retrospective data set and you know get state of the art performance and publish a good paper but actually you really need to do proper clinical validation and that might need sort of more robust clinical studies it might need prospective studies it might even need a randomized clinic uh, randomized controlled trial in some settings so the clinical validation but then, of course, the other blocker that everybody's aware of is regulatory approval. And so whatever, if you're going to use this, this an AI system, like a deep learning system as an image classifier or something, you're going to need regulatory approval. It's software as a medical device in almost all situations. <clears throat> and so people realize that that's something that has very specific expertise, requires a significant amount of time and resources to be able to get regulatory approval. <clears throat> but I think that's for most people, particularly clinical academics, that's kind of like the extent of their appreciation of the challenges in implementation. <clears throat> the real challenges I think are actually much more than that. So actually imagine you've got your FDA approval uh, and you've got this like an AI system that can look at OCT scans well, the big question then is, 
how can that system be integrated into existing uh, imaging uh, 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 systems from imaging vendors, uh, integrated into electronic health records, integrated into patient pathways? Um, you know, if you have an, an AI system that it gives some state of the art prediction or classification, but if it takes two minutes to give that prediction, is that going to be okay in a high volume clinic? where things need to move very quickly, and it might not be. So there's the integration, but there's also the issue of um, of the, the business models and the health economics of this. So you might have a cool AI system, but if your business model is that, uh, you know, people have to pay £15 every time they run the model on an OCT scan or in a retinal photograph, well, does that make sense? Is uh, are people going to be prepared to pay for that in private practice? Are insurance companies going to be going to be going to be prepared to pay for that? Um, are um, you know is the NHS going to be able to pay for that? And my prediction is that the NHS is not going to pay for stuff unless it's actually shown to lead to better outcomes or shown to lead to more efficiency or other things like that. And to, to prove that, you probably need to have some pretty good studies to do it. And then even if you have a good business model, are doctors and other healthcare professionals actually going to use what you've done? And they might just be like, oh, you know, uh, I don't need this new technology. I'm perfectly good with my own stethoscope or my own um you know old school approach and they may not they may not see a real benefit from the new technologies so it's it's multiple different it's a multi-pronged problem i would say mm, mm. and where are we currently with the deployments of large-scale eye scanning models within healthcare <laughs> so i think um i think ophthalmology is is not bad in this regard uh but only with regard to other medical specialties so in other words, it's it's actually still very much in the early stages. So, you know, I work in Moorfields Eye Hospital, you know, one of the, the oldest eye hospital in the world, largest eye hospital in Europe or North America, but we don't use any AI in our day-to-day -day practice. And we're supposedly at the forefront of a lot of this research. So you you do have a couple of AI systems that do automated diabetic retinopathy screening that have FDA approval and some other international regulatory approvals, and they are now starting to be used in the US, but they're not yet being used in the UK, because actually the UK already has a very, very good national screening program for diabetic retinopathy that uses human graders. And so it's still a little bit uncertain whether it would make sense from a health economic perspective to replace that system with a kind of potentially expensive automated AI system. Um, so I think we're still we're still very much in the early stages. And what machine learning models have you used for most of your projects, and why have you chosen those models mm. over other ones? So I think that um, for the most part, when I talk about AI, um, and I know for some people that term kind of is like nails on a blackboard because it seems a little bit too kind of hype uh, focused or a little bit too vague. Um, but for me, most of my focus has been on uh, deep learning models. And so I guess different flavors of convolutional neural networks, because most of the work we do is around image classification. I think um, what's been happening more recently is that my research group is, is increasingly interested in uh, something called vision transformers. And this is a type of architecture that's had uh, transformers or a type of architecture that have had a lot of, had a lot of success in, lar in creation of large language models. And they're starting to be incorporated into vision, into image classification tasks as well. So we're beginning to explore that a lot. And then the other, the other point I would say is that we're also beginning to transition a little bit away from supervised learning approaches to um, this new approach that is getting a lot of excitement at the moment, which is called self-supervised learning. And so we're starting to use um, you know, these self-supervised approaches. And essentially what we try and do is identify 
cool work that's being done outside healthcare. Uh, like, for example, Facebook released this self-supervised learning approach or described the self-supervised learning approach called masked autoencoders. And essentially, we're beginning to explore how we can use that within a healthcare setting. Mm. And I guess that the move move towards self-supervised learning would be to reduce the burden on you and your team in the labeling. So that's, that's it, exactly. So, <clears throat> you know, if you have 10 million chest x-rays, well, the major problem then is how are you going to get labels for those 10 million chest x-rays? Mm. And that's going to be a, ma a major issue. And maybe you can get labels for a few thousand of those chest x-rays, even with a large amount of work. Maybe you can create some kind of automated labeling from the electronic health record, but that's going to be very noisy and, and sort of challenging. But if you could, with, with self-supervised learning, you can essentially um, create a model that learns some kind of like representation of what the, the features of chest x-rays as a whole. And then the idea is then you can just get a very small number of labeled examples and train that for some downstream clinical task. So in my world of ophthalmology, imagine if you had 10 million retinal photographs, you use self-supervised learning, and then you get a small number of labels for diagnosis of glaucoma. And you train that in a supervised way, and then you have a nice glaucoma model. And then you get a small number of labels for diabetic retinopathy, and you do the same, and the same for macular degeneration, and so on and so forth. And so that seems like that seems like the one of the most exciting things that I've come across in AI and healthcare. And it's this idea of, can we make foundation models for healthcare mm. applications? Mm. And other than this uh, self-supervised learning approach that's come out recently, are there any other um, techniques that you've found to improve the, or increase the volume and the speed of medical data labeling? So I think we're still only dipping our toes in the water of these unsupervised approaches. So I think it would probably be too much to say that we've just we 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 uh, just choose between them. We're at the, mm. just sort of seeing how far we can take these self-supervised learning approaches. And I'm anticipating that they're going to take over more and more in the coming years. Um, I think so. This doesn't answer your question exactly, but I think. We've we've developed a lot of expertise in choosing the right problems where we can get, where we know that there will be a, an abundance of labels that are likely to be of good quality. And so we tend to, and that the problem is clinically meaningful. Mm. And so that's, I think, a strength that we as clinical academics can bring that would be very hard for an engineer who has no domain knowledge to be able to, to answer those questions. And how does the overlap between uh, your t team members with medical and computational expertise, say if you're working on a particular project, um, how do you find the collaboration between the medical and the computational side of the expertise? How does that process work? So I feel, um, I feel very proud and very privileged that we've made this We've started to build this team where we have computer scientists and medics who can speak the same language to a, to a greater or lesser extent, or speak enough of the other person's language that we can have meaningful conversations. And I have to say, that's not always the case. I think um, nine times out of 10, if you're a clinician and you're going to collaborate with a pure computer scientist, there's going to be a lot lost in translation. And there is going to be the type of things that might excite a computer scientist are often very different from the type of things that might excite a clinician. <laughs> uh, and so um, I guess I've been fortunate to be able to work with this new, new breed of medical students, new breed of junior doctors who have got their finger on the pulse of the latest advances in machine learning. And they all, I think that's underpinned by good stats knowledge. So I think of someone like Siegfried Wagner, who I work with, who's uh, uh, doing a PhD with me, funded by the Medical Research Council and is an ophthalmology trainee. And he has got very, very good statistical modeling expertise. And uh, in some ways, that's as valuable 
or maybe even more valuable than just being very, very good at training a, a, a convolutional neural network. Uh, because that's such a complementary skill set to what the computer scientists have. It would be very difficult for um, someone who's a medic who spent their whole life in medical school and medical training uh, to ever have the same skill set as someone who has done a PhD in machine learning, and before that a master's, and before that a computer science undergraduate degree. And um, you, you, you can never be as good as those, those people, but you can speak enough of their language that you can work in a complementary fashion. What project are you working on currently that you're most excited by? So that's like asking me to choose which, which of my <laughs> children is my favorite. But I, I think one of the most exciting is a, a project we have called the Alts Eye Project for Alzheimer's Eye. And so this is a project where we've taken all the retinal photographs and all the OCT scans of Morpheus over a 10 year period in people over the age of 40 years. And we, we have received ethical approvals and permissions to link them with a national database from NHS Digital called Hospital Episode Statistics. So that effectively means we know every patient who's had an eye scan done in this time period at Moorfields, and if that patient has moved to Liverpool and then had a stroke, then essentially we have that information. Or if they've uh, moved to Grimsby and developed multiple sclerosis or uh, leukemia or any of a range of hundreds of different systemic diseases, and including Alzheimer's disease and different causes of dementia, that we have those labels. So we've been able to get this data set that at least initially is about 6.3 million images associated with all of the, the, the hospital episode statistic data. And so we're working now to train uh, machine learning models to predict systemic disease from eye examination. And we've one of my friends and collaborators is a guy called Alistair Denniston, who's a professor in Birmingham, and he's coined the term oculomics to describe what we think is going to be an emerging field. This idea that you can take massive data sets, advanced retinal imaging, and apply AI to them. And then maybe we can supercharge, supercharge the vision of using the eye as a window to the rest of the body. Where do you see machine learning being implemented in healthcare in the next five years that it isn't currently? Um, <clears throat> so, so I think one of the things that's going to be really interesting <clears throat> is what are the use cases for machine learning that might not require regulatory approval because of the sort of ch the challenges around regulatory approval that I've just described, and appropriately so, the requirements for a lot of uh, clinical eff efficacy and safety data. Uh, but one actually very low hanging fruit, I think, is going to be clinical trial recruitment, and and so particularly in very imaging dominated medical specialties such as ophthalmology. Uh, a lot of the, the lot of the determination of whether suit, someone is suitable for a clinical trial comes from their images. So, for example, we could train an AI system to to pick up um, age related macular degeneration from retinal photographs, and um, that's the commonest cause of blindness in the UK by far. You know, we have you know mm. four hundred people every single day developing the, the blinding forms of AMD just in the UK. And so uh, if you have an AI system that can help with, um, essentially you run it on the imaging, the ophthalmic imaging systems in every hospital, in every center around the UK or around the world, and it will identify every patient that it thinks is eligible for a certain clinical trial. And then those patients could be potentially screened by humans to actually get them into the trial. It seems like that that's a use case that is a very low hanging fruit that, but that also would be potentially transformative that we're likely to see in the next couple of years. And have you found any books particularly useful? 
let me see I'm looking around me now to see um so i guess a few if i can name a few different absolutely uh, yeah things. so um one of them one of them that i've got here is the making of the atomic bomb by richard rhodes kind of a, mm. a famous book it's a kind of a bit of a long read but describes uh the those manhattan project mm. and describes not just the kind of years of the manhattan project but it does the the advances in nuclear physics that occurred in the decades before the Manhattan Project. And so I just think that that's a really interesting book because it just describes how humanity was able to come together to do this innovation. And of course, it, you know, maybe um, the potentially massive negative aspects to this innovation as well, but, but nonetheless, a, a kind of staggering scientific achievement. I think uh, another one that I... Um, I'm just looking at here that has helped me a lot is called Range, How Generalists Triumph in a Specialized World by David uh, Epstein, which I've read a couple of times. And so this is something that um, I just find find quite fascinating because I think um, when you're when you're younger, you often spend all of your time focusing and getting deep knowledge in a very narrow area. So you want to become like a very good chess player or a very good tennis player or uh, very good at maths or something like that. And you sp you focus on on those things. Um, but actually, as you as you get older, you realize that a lot of the major challenges that we face are not so narrowly defined as that. And you have to have you have to be able to have range. You have to be able to have knowledge across multiple different areas across multiple different domains and somehow integrate that knowledge to create new breakthroughs and new innovations and so that that has inspired me quite a lot mm. uh, oh and one more one more is um i'm just reading about i'm just reading a biography of thomas edison at the moment by uh, edmund morris and i I think Thomas Edison is really inspiring because I think that there's a lot that we can learn about the implementation of AI systems from Thomas Edison. And so I think that at the moment, like probably when I've given previous uh, interviews, I talked about books like The Innovators, which talked about the history of Silicon Valley and the digital re revolution over the last 50 years. And I think people have focused on that. Uh, you know, the advent of the computer, advent of the internet, etc. But actually, they've missed this 19th century and early 20th century innovation by people like Thomas Edison. And so famously, he was the father of the electrical age. And so um, in, you know, 1882, he, there's this famous moment where he, they flipped a switch in Lower Manhattan and they lit up the whole Pearl Street district of Lower Manhattan and that was the dawning of the electrical age. But actually, the thing was that in the 25 years before 1882, there had been more than 20 different patents for electric light bulbs. But yet, we don't date the dawning of the electrical age to then. And so what, what happened was that there was all these people, all these event inventors all around the world who could get a, li a prototype light bulb and they could like turn it on and it would create a light for like a couple of minutes and they would get a journalist who would come into the room and see this and say, oh, wow, that's that's nice. And then they would they would the journalist would be ushered out of the room before the light bulb would you know stop lighting or, you know, stop working. Uh, but actually, the genius of Thomas Edison was requiring that it wasn't just about creating a light bulb. It was about creating a system of innovations to be able to allow the implementation of electrical light. So in the case of the lower Manhattan, it was building a generator that could generate the electricity, building a distribution system or a grid so that electricity could be distributed to the houses in that region, building some way that the grid could be linked to the electrical light bulbs in the houses or in the street lights, building some kind of measurement system or meter that could sort of monitor usage of it and bringing those all together and i feel like with with ai with clinical ai at the moment 
we're we're in the stage still where we can kind of do a cool demo and maybe like publish a good research paper but actually we don't yet have the system of innovations the network of innovations to really take advantage of this technology fantastic uh, analogy I, I like that very much <laughs> very nice um, thank you so do you have any advice for any students who are interested in the computational medicine space? So maybe some indirect advice. Um, so I think it's very good for people to um, learn coding and all of those things. But actually the, the, the top two things that I look for when people come to join the join my research group and when I'm thinking about their sort of potential to do to supervise as a PhD student or other things, I look for the ability to write and good stats knowledge. And so if you've written scientific papers, peer reviewed papers before, then that's a very, very encouraging sign, particularly if you have a number of different publications, particularly if you have original research articles as a first author. Because that means you know how hard it is to take a, take it through to the publication. You know, it can take a year or more in many cases to make that happen. And then the stats knowledge is just because that's always going to be super, super useful. And um, if you've got good, good stats experience, you'll find that you actually get you get much more publications because people will always be looking for you to help with their papers and things like that. And it also provides some kind of element of critical thinking skills that are pretty much essential for mm. uh, the life of a clinical academic. So those would be the two things that I look for as even more so than whether someone has done an uh, intermediate course in Python or, mm. or something like that. Mm. And lastly, are there any approaches that you have used in your projects that you think you found particularly helpful? I don't think that I have any unique approach, um, but I, I think one of the things that I'm, I've been relatively good at is being able to take a zoomed out view of things uh, to connect the dots between multiple different specialized areas to achieve cool things. Um, so, um, let me think of it. Let me think of an example on, on that. Uh, well, so I can't think of a, a specific example at the moment, but uh, that that sort of high level approach, I think, is really important. And I think closely related to that is thinking, and this is kind of an obvious thing, but thinking about what is the end goal that you want to achieve and working backwards from there. And so it's like, suppose you want to develop an AI system that could be used in retinal scanners, in optometrists uh, around the world. So it's it's like, okay, that's the end goal. Now, now, what would be the step before that? What would be the step before that? What would be the step before that? Working through all of the, the, pro, all of the, the steps. I think it's a very common thing that in people that I interact with, where they only just think about what's the next step in front of their nose as opposed to the steps five or 10 steps down, down, the, down the pathway. And they might be thinking about just publishing a paper. In fact, probably like 90% of people, 90% of clinical academics, they just want to publish a paper and they just give lip service to the idea that this is something that needs to be translated as a subsequent step to actually achieve real world benefit. A big thank you to Professor Keane for taking his time for the podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please do leave a review. Thanks very much and catch you next time.